What's up, Colt? My name is Jack Neal, and welcome back to my YouTube channel, where we cover all things horrifying, disturbing, and morbid. In today's video, we're talking about three unique killers who all got what they deserved, but the cases gradually get more disturbing. If you haven't already, make sure to murder that like button, or else. Let's get into today's video, and don't forget, look behind you. Do you recognize the boy in this photo? Well, no one does. All we know is he's the 29th victim of Dean Coral, the Candyman Killer. It's Christmas Eve, 1939. In Fort Wayne, Indiana, a baby boy named Dean enters the world. He's the first child of Mary Robinson and Arnold Coral, whose relationship is characterized by constant arguing and radically different parenting techniques. Arnold's the strict, authoritative father, and Mary the kind, nurturing mother. These differences eventually lead to the couple's divorce four years after the birth of Dean's younger brother Stanley. Soon after, Arnold gets drafted to the Air Force and is stationed in Tennessee. So Mary sells the family home and takes the two boys to Memphis because she wants them to have a relationship with their dad. Dean grows up to be a quiet, sweet little boy who rarely talks to other kids. At seven years old, Dean catches a disease called rheumatic fever, which remains undiagnosed for years until doctors later discover he has a heart murmur in 1950. At about this time, Dean's parents remarry and move to the suburbs of Houston, Texas. However, this relationship is short-lived because three years later, Arnold and Mary again file for divorce, with Mary retaining custody of their two boys. She eventually remarries a man by the name of Jake West. Together, the family starts a candy company out of their garage where Dean works long hours while attending school. After he graduates high school, the family opens up a new shop near the city called Pecan Prince. Dean works there for a couple years until 1960, his mom asks him to live with his grandmother in Indiana. There, he dates a girl for a short period of time before ultimately rejecting her after she proposes to him. Dean eventually moves back to Texas after his mother files for divorce from Jake West in 1963 and helps her start a new candy business which they call Coral Candy Company. She appoints Dean as the vice president of the company and makes his younger brother Stanley the treasurer. The following year, Dean gets drafted to the US Army and does basic training in Louisiana. He's assigned to train as a radio repairman, but he hates every minute of it. During his time in the service, Dean starts having various sexual relationships with his fellow comrades and begins to fully realize that he was homosexual. Eventually, he requests to be discharged to go back to his family in Texas, and the Army grants this request honorably after 10 months of service. When he returns, acquaintances of Dean notice subtle differences in his mannerisms, especially in the company of teenage males that lead them to believe that he's homosexual. In 1965, the Coral family relocates the candy shop next to an elementary school. Dean becomes popular around town and they call him the Candy Man, because he's known for giving out free candy to kids especially young boys. Coral Candy Company employs just a few workers and Dean is known to be especially flirtatious to the teenage male employees. The rear end of the candy shop is a popular hangout spot for kids because Dean's installed a pool table and regularly gives out free candy. He eventually becomes particularly friendly with a 12 year old boy named David Brooks. See, little David lacks two things money, and friendship. Dean quickly realizes this, giving him whatever he wants and treating him with kindness. The two become close friends and often go on trips together, with David admiring Dean so much that he sees him as a second father. However, the nature of their relationship is far from innocent because whenever David needs money, Dean needs something far more sinister sexual favors. Some time passes and Dean eventually closes the candy shop, taking a job as a local electrician. And right after he takes this position, Dean Coral's murder spree begins. It starts with a teenage boy named Jeffrey Conan, an underclassman at UT Austin who's stranded after his friend drops him off alone in uptown Houston. He sticks his thumb out, hoping someone can give him a lift to his home nearby, and that's when Dean Coral pulls up beside him. 
the boy mysteriously vanishes, and his body is found three years later at High Island Beach. At around this time, David Brooks catches Dean assaulting two teenage boys strapped to a bed and threatens to call the authorities. Dean offers the boy a Corvette in exchange for his silence, and that's when David gets in deep. The two strike a deal, and the Candyman begins offering David referrals. 200 bucks for every boy he can lure into Dean's apartment. David starts with two 14-year-old boys from a religious rally and takes them to Dean's apartment. Then it's two brothers, Donald and Jerry Waldrop, who are walking on their way home, 15-year-old Randall Harvey, 16-year-old Gregory Malley Winkle, 13-year-old David Hilgeist, all abused physically, sexually, and psychologically until their ultimate demise. 14 boys total are taken over the course of a year, but no one makes it out alive. In winter 1971, David introduces 15-year-old Elmer Henley to Dean, and he decides that he would make a better ally than a victim. Dean offers a similar deal to the one David has, $200 for every boy Elmer can bring into his so-called white slavery ring. Elmer initially ignores Dean's offer, but ultimately succumbs due to his family's financial struggles. Fast forward to March 24th, 1972. The trio sees a friend of Elmer's leaving a restaurant. The boy, Frank Aguirre, is convinced to hang out at Dean's apartment with the promise of drinking and smoking. They walk inside the apartment and 18-year-old Frank spots a pair of handcuffs on the table next to him. He picks them up to inspect them, and suddenly Dean jumps on top of him, pushes him against a table, and handcuffs his hands behind his back. Elmer begs Dean not to hurt Frank, but it's at this moment that he realizes there is no white slavery ring, and Dean uses these boys for his personal enjoyment. Later that night, the trio buries Frank's body in High Island Beach, and this actually sparks an interest within Elmer of Dean's sadistic ways. Together, the three murdered dozens of more boys until the evening of August 7th, 1973. Elmer, now 17 years old, invites his friend Timothy Curley to Dean's residence. See, Timothy's actually partied at Dean's place a few times before, so naturally he accepts the offer. Elmer and Timothy get to Dean's, drink and smoke until around midnight before leaving the house, promising that they'll be returning shortly. The two park near Elmer's house, where outside of the car they hear loud noises coming from the home of their friend Rhonda. She's nursing a sprained ankle, having gotten into a fight with her drunken father, and joins the boys on the car ride back to Dean's. And when they arrive, he's furious. He cannot believe that Elmer's brought a girl into his house and tells him privately that he's ruined everything. Eventually, however, he calms down and the teens pass out a few hours later. Later, Elmer wakes up on his stomach to find Dean snapping handcuffs on his wrist. There's tape over his mouth, his ankles are tied up, and he looks over to see Timothy and Rhonda tied up next to him. Dean gives a very angry look at the three and says, man, you blew it bringing a girl. Elmer immediately begins begging for his life, promising to help Dean with whatever sadistic actions he wants to take against his friends. Dean eventually ignores him and starts cutting away at Timothy's clothes, and that's when Elmer jumps up, grabs Dean's gun, pointing it directly at him, shouting, you've gone far enough, Dean. He fires several rounds into his shoulder before Dean turns around, runs out of the room, hitting the wall and falling on his way out. He fires three additional bullets into his lower back before Dean slides down the wall in the hallway, dying with his naked body facing toward the wall. Elmer then releases Timothy and Rhonda, they call the police, and sit outside waiting on the front porch. When officers arrive, they confiscate the pistol and put the three teens into a patrol car. Elmer tells police that he shot Dean in self-defense, but later confesses to helping him murder several teenage boys. Elmer's charged with six counts of murder, and David Brooks is given one count. David's currently serving life in prison, and Elmer? Six 99-year consecutive life sentences. The true number of young male victims is unknown, but we do know of at least 28 that's deaths took place between 1970 and 1973 all of which were strangled, shot, or both. Dean's own mother claims that there are many other victims, and residents of Texas theorize that their bodies are buried around the candy factory. It's spring of 1906, and the people of a little town in Morocco called Marrakesh are experiencing a big problem. Dozens of young girls are vanishing from the city with no trace left behind. First, it's 10 women, then 20, 
30, and by the time the 36th woman is reported missing, her family provides authorities with the name of a key suspect. Haj Muhammad Misfui is a shoemaker in Marrakesh and lives with an older woman named Anna Rahali, who's 70 years old. Moroccan authorities later arrive at Hodge's home where they discover the cold truth. They find the remains of 20 women buried underneath the house and discover another 16 in their nearby garden. See, Moroccan women would often come to the shop where they were greeted by Anna and Hodge who would offer to have lunch with them. However, this was the deadliest mistake they could have made because the food was drugged and Hodge would murder them in their sleep and steal their possessions. This leads to him locally being dubbed as the Marrakesh Art Killer. Authorities immediately take him and Anna to a prison, but along the way the townspeople are filled with rage and are seeking vengeance. This grows more and more, especially as the families of the victims begin to get involved and the people begin tormenting Hodge and Anna. She is soon killed by the crowd, but Hodge survives and the Moroccan government sentences him to be executed by crucifixion. Foreign officials actually hear about the execution and offer that crucifixion is a wee bit outdated. They suggest that the Moroccan government should instead issue him to die by immurement. And what's immurement, you may ask? Well, it's a Latin word that translates to in wall, meaning that Hajj was sentenced to be walled up in a box with no spaces without his knowledge. While it's being constructed, however, the people thirst to watch this man suffer for his crimes. Soon after, he's led away from his holding cell into the center of the market square and is whipped repeatedly in the days leading to his execution. Two masons create a hole in thick walls about two feet deep and six feet high and secure chains on the back wall to make sure Hodge both could not escape or even sit down. As he's chained up, the crowd throws trash and various animal parts at him, and the masons soon step forward to begin the immurement. Brick by brick, Hodge slowly begins to realize what's happening to him. When the last brick is laid and the opening is completely filled, the crowd goes silent. Time slowly passes and Hodge occasionally cries out in despair, to which the crowd responds with thunderous applause. He's heard screaming his head off for two days straight before finally falling silent on the third day. The townspeople are left infuriated, claiming that he died far too early. Before I go on to the final and most disturbing of today's stories, I just wanted to note that it is kind of weird to see a crowd of ordinary people be so quick to torment a man labeled as a murderer. While writing this video, I was brought back to a concept known as mob mentality, in which a group of individuals act not as what they personally would do, but what other members of the group are doing. Politicians know this, which is why they have slogans and rallies. Sports teams know this as well, which is why they have chants and songs. Look, I know this is easier said than done, but before casting judgment on another person, ask yourself, do I really think this person is in the wrong and should be punished this way, or are others telling me that this person is in the wrong and should be punished this way? Let me know your guys' thoughts. Do you think mob mentality is a good thing or a bad thing? Do you ever find yourself doing this? Anyway, let's get on to the next story. December 1999. The chief editor of a local newspaper in Lahore, Pakistan called The Jang receives a very mysterious letter. It's signed by a 38-year-old wealthy man named Javad Iqbal. It reads, I've killed 100 children all boys, and place their bodies in acid-filled drums. In terms of expense, including the acid, it cost me 120 rupees to erase each victim. Javad is the sixth child of a family of ten born to a rich businessman and trader named Muhammad Ali Mogul. He's a spoiled kid who from a young age develops bad habits and later spends most of his time perusing about with a group of underage boys. Local people call him the boy hunter because he's known as the type of guy to drop everything in pursuit of his sadistic needs. He goes to various extremes to lure boys into his circle. He finds the most effective of these is to find children magazines and reach out and become pen friends. He then makes lists of the quote-unquote attractive ones and spends thousands upon thousands pampering them up with small gifts like perfumes, tickets, and coins. Family members of Javad find out about his bizarre, strange habits, but 
He won't let them say anything or interfere in any way. In late 1990, Javad receives a formal complaint from a man who claims that he has sodomized his son. Police are unable to capture Javad, so instead they arrest his father and brother and detain them for seven days straight. On the eighth day, one of the boys staying with Javad is arrested at his house, causing him to surrender in an effort to release the boy. Okay, I know this story is already so messed up, but it's crazy to me that this man wouldn't even surrender himself to release his own father and brother, but he would do anything for one of his boys. For instance, all of Javad's life, his family's been trying to arrange his marriage, and one day, out of the blue, he stuns everyone when he selects a bride. By no surprise, however, it's the older sister of one of his boys, and that way, he can't escape Javad. Similarly, he arranges that his baby sister marries one of the boys, leading people to dub him as an evil genius. Javad's entire life purpose is devoted to luring in underage boys. He regularly throws money on the floor of the shop and keeps a close eye on the boy who picks it up. He then makes a big announcement claiming that there's a thief and searches all the boys until he finds his money. That boy is then taken into a separate room where the unthinkable happens. The townspeople hear about this and tell their kids not to visit the arcades, so Javon starts a gym and buys an aquarium. He even sets up a school, which he calls Sunnyside, but it fails because no one wants to send their kids there. You're probably wondering, if everyone already knows what's going on, then why isn't this guy straight out of a horror movie being sent to prison? Well, being that he's a rich, educated man, Javad regularly interacts with law enforcement and even puts his own money toward a monthly magazine where he writes about the heroic deeds of local police officers. Later, Javad's dad Muhammad passes away in 1993, leaving behind a real estate fortune. He uses the money to construct a mansion, with a pond in his basement and a pool in his backyard. Eventually, however, he sells his estate and moves to another town where the disturbing process begins again. He opens up a video game shop, but in September of 1998, he and one of his employees get assaulted while on the job. Javad's left with severe damage to his skull and is unconscious at a hospital for three weeks. Police initially label the incident as a robbery, but the other employee soon comes forward and calls Javad out for his other crimes. He's later granted bail, but no members of his family are willing to pay for it. Authorities end up selling his cars, mansion, and video game store to pay the bill, and when Javad finds out, he is completely enraged. This situation, along with a previous incident in which he was assaulted by police, sparks Javad's killing spree in May 1999. The letters sent to the newspaper, along with a 32-page journal, describe his in-depth confession. He says he's forcibly touched and murdered exactly 100 boys between the ages of 6 and 16 and disposed of their bodies in vats of hydrochloric acid. Police raid his house to find photographs of these victims and various pieces of evidence to verify these claims. Police then proceed to launch the biggest manhunt in Pakistan history, but they're unable to capture Javad until he turns himself in on December 30th, 1999. He's taken into custody, and when he's put on trial, the judge sentences him to death. He states, You will be strangled to death in front of the parents whose children you killed. Your body will then be cut into 100 pieces and put in acid, the same way you killed the children. However, Javad's found dead in his cell a week before the execution can be carried out. And you're probably thinking, well, Javad didn't get what was coming to him. Take it as a test. Do you really think the families of a victim want to watch a man die in the same way that their own son was killed? And after hearing the crimes of the previous two criminals, were you truly satisfied in the way that they were killed? If they'd taken the life of, let's say, your younger brother or older sister, how would you feel then? Honestly, I'm pretty conflicted on this one. My instincts say that criminals should die humanely because of instances of false accusations and judges and juries having biases towards certain groups of people. But if I was certain that someone had done this to one of my family members, I'm not entirely sure if I'd feel the same way. This isn't because I want to see bad people suffer, but it's because I want to keep good people from suffering. I don't really have a solid opinion on this one, so let me know your thoughts. And as always, stay spooky, YouTube.